Yeah, the, yeah, that's when you get better sounds on the beat. Well, it's good to see everyone this morning. And uh, we live in interesting times. Uh, we're seeing things happen today and happen at a fast pace that we probably never thought we would see. I mean, have, did you ever think that they would come when a Christian university and the board of trustees would make a public policy statement that they support biblical marriage and sexuality. That's radical, right? 70% yeah. <laughs> of the faculty thought it was and they came out and condemned it. Seventy percent condemned the statement and voted no confidence in the board of trustees of the university. <laughs> Seattle Pacific University. Oh, that's yeah. just like it. <laughs> I could hit a little closer to home to something we might raise our eyebrows about a little more, but I won't. But that just happened this week. So you look at that. And you, you know, I didn't catch any stories this week about anyone else who's a celebrity in Christianity leaving the faith. Um, I know that we may still have some time left today for something to pop up. <laughs> but we're in days of what I would call sorting. God is sorting things out. And what he's really sorting today is what he's always sorting. And that is the real from the fake. Now, I'm not, when I say fake, I don't, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying, you know, some people who think they're in the fake aren't. They're into something. Uh, they, they may be into religion. They may be into spirituality. They, they might be into uh Jesus stories or they may admire Jesus but they've never been changed by him. They've never been a disciple. You see that when the going gets tough and the sorting begins all that's left is disciples. Everyone else leaves. And so don't be disheartened by reports of well this Christian celebrity, they, all, they don't call them celebrity, they call them believers. Uh, has decided the Bible's not true, they're not going to be a Christian anymore and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's not what we're getting into today, but it does tie into what we're going to look at today. And if I had to title it, it would be this, when God does a new thing. When God does a new thing, because where we're at with Israel in our story, in our journey through Exodus, is God's beginning a new thing with them. And they didn't know it. They didn't realize what was going on. So last week we looked at Mara and what happened at Mara. And what happened at Mara? Let's we'll do a little quiz. What happened at Mara? What now? They drank the bitter water. And what made the water bitter? It was a laxity. <laughs> Mom, that's right. They, they went to mom with their tummy ache. And like my mom, they had to drink the magnesium water. And uh, even though God did soften it a little bit and uh, let Moses throw the stick in to make it not so bitter, but that's what happened. And it was symbolic of what God was going to be doing to their world. That he was flushing it out. Because all they knew was Egypt. It's kind of like a, uh, someone who comes to Christ today and all they know is the world. All that has to be flushed out. And so uh, they had that experience there. We could just call, call that the cleansing effect. And then they went from cleansing to rest, respite at Elam. God doesn't speak to them at Elam. Elam's those good times in life and everything's great. 
The car started this morning, not like the day before. There's there's money in the bank, lo and behold. I got that stimulus check. I don't know where it came from. And, and you know, everything's going great. There's no real problems. And if you ever take time to notice, when you're in those Elam times, heaven's silent many times. But then we get to another phase in this process of God doing a new thing. And that's just, we'll just describe this as going to school. Because Israel is about to go to God's school for 40 years. Now, my wife says I've been in school 40 years. <laughs> just about was. But they were going to a different kind of school. They were going to the school of hard knocks. Uh, it's the desert school. And they're going to learn many times the hard way to trust God. And here's the thing about trust. You know, we hear a lot about faith in God today. But faith in God today is really supposed to be trust in God today. And trust is active. I'd say that because when you say faith, oh, okay, well, yeah, I believe in God, Mom, Apple Pie, and Chevrolet. Yeah, I believe. That's not trust. That's just affirmation. And some people have affirmation of a belief in God, but they don't have a relationship with God because they've never trusted. They never acted on it. And so God's going to treat, teach these people how to trust God. In him. So in Exodus 16, uh, it's a rather long chapter, so I trimmed it for us. Uh, so part of it I'm just going to run through, and this first part we're going to read. So Exodus 16, verse 1 <clears throat> The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community praised Moses and Aaron for leading them into freedom. <laughs> no, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. I think this is why Moses, one reason why Moses had the, that 40 year period of dealing with stubborn sheep. Because sheep can be like people. Goats can definitely be like people. They're stubborn, they do what they want. A goat, I tell you what, have you ever, anybody ever had goats here? Just forget offense. Because whatever fence you put up, they're going through it. They under it, over it, some kind of way. Uh, they're just like that. That's true. They'll eat anything. Things they shouldn't eat, they'll eat it too. They're, and you can't do anything with a goat. Uh, my dad one time got the crazy notion. He had two crazy notions. One time he bought some sheep. They all got eaten by something. Uh, he did sell the last one. And then he decided he was going to learn a biblical lesson from goats. So he started with two. And it wasn't too long after that, he had about 25. And Vince was irrelevant. And we would try to catch him and he'd catch Vince and take him to the cell. Forget it. Uh, whatever you tried, they would go the other direction. So one year at July 4th, he ran an ad in the open products. Fresh goat meat. <laughs> on the book. Be, on, be at my house at such and such time, and I'm going to be selling fresh goat meat for this money. How much was a goat? Our yard was full. <laughs> I mean, there were cars everywhere. It looked like Walmart on, on a Black Friday. And uh, what he would do is he would load all these people, he would load them up in the back of his truck, and he would go down to where the goats were, and they were just wherever they wanted to be. And uh, he would say, which way do you want? 
Ooh, I, I like that one right there. Okay. Bang. <laughs> and go get it. Take it in the car. There you go. That'll be that much money. Take the next one. And we did that all day long. He trimmed his herd down to two again. <laughs> he had one goat that would fight with the bull. Of course, the bull won. But the goat didn't kick him. He was so stubborn. And he would just headbutt that bull. And that bull would throw him all over the place. He'd get up, headbutt the bull again. And he would just keep headbutting the bull. See, that's what goats are. That's uh, the whole community grown. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in future. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Moses, you messed up again. Why in the world did you even mention that we could be free? Why, Moses? Why didn't you? We had life good back there in bondage. Remember last week, I told you when Pharaoh comes back, he always invites you home. And he always says, hey, you know, your buddies are back there. A familiar life's back there. Your routine is back there. Now, it may be a little worse this time. Bondage may be a little worse this time. But you've got some people back there who are welcome. Why do you want to fool around this freedom stuff? Freedom's scary. Freedom, you have to be responsible. Come on back here. Come on back home. And now they're saying, Moses, when we was back in Egypt, we just sat around the pots all day and ate. That's kind of like saying we hung out at the Golden Corral all day long. And we, whenever we got ready to eat, we could. that was not their life. But see what happens when we get out of our comfort zone. Because God is leading us out of our comfort zone. And we get out in our little desert where life starts getting hard. We have a primrose view of what we came out of. Oh, maybe. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've heard, uh, you know, as they look around at things that are happening in the day, and they say, oh, I remember the simple days of my childhood. We would just sit around and, and watch Gene Reagan, and we would, you know, just in fan our all day long, and life was so good. Everybody loved each other, and we had all kinds of well, see, that's because you didn't have air conditioning. <laughs> and they don't remember that. And that's because you, your TV was probably like mine and only got Channel 4. And, uh, you know, all this, all, oh, man, life was so good back then. We, every night we'd just lay in bed and sweat. There's nothing good about that. <laughs> there, there was nothing good about that. But see, it's, it's reminiscing. And when you reminisce, it gets so sentimental. Oh, life is so good. You know why we do that? Because we know how that turned out. Yes. There's no great mystery. The mystery is right now. How will things turn out today? And that's frightening. That's scary. And for these people, they're in the desert. And the food is, there is no food. And so they're wondering, Moses, what have you done to us? This is the way it's supposed to be. God's supposed to drop a McDonald's everywhere we want to eat. And I imagine they were getting hungry because they, not too long earlier, had the laxative effect. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what happened? First of all, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. And so I'm going to stop the reading there and just kind of give you a summary of the rest. So he gives them the promise, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to rain down uh, 
manna, what we would call manna, and he's, he promises quail too. I'm going to kind of focus on the manna here. And every morning, he said, Here, here's the deal. Here's the test. Every morning, you're to go out and collect enough food for that day. Now, if you collect any more than that, it's going to spoil. And on the sixth day, you can collect enough for the seventh day because you're not going to get anything on the seventh day. And so that set up the test. And, and as you read the text, if you go back and read the text, you find out what happens is, it says some of them paid no attention to Moses. And, the, and they gathered extra on the days they weren't supposed to, and it spoiled during the night. Or they didn't gather extra on the sixth day, and they went hungry on the seventh. And so the test was, will you obey? Can I tell you, anybody here ever like tests in school? Anybody just, oh, I love test day. No, nobody likes test day. And I told you all about the worst test they ever took. As far as the, the significance of it was comps when I was getting my, my doctorate. And there were 20 something of us supposed to take it that day. Now, only did them once a year. And so, and we all had to be in Lynchburg, Virginia to take them at the university. So, I, we, the deal went with me. We showed up and went to the hotel where everybody, I figured, was staying, or I'd heard they were staying, and I didn't see anybody I knew. And then that next morning, I saw one guy I knew that had been in the program with me and no one else. And so I asked him, have you seen the other guys? And he said, no, I haven't seen anybody. So we went to the, where we were supposed to go at, on campus and we get to the room, there's the two of us. And they had the room set up for 20 something people. And a friend of mine was proctoring the test and I said, well, where's everybody else? He said, well, that's an interesting story. They're all here. But they started meeting yesterday. They were going to have a study group. And then they started talking among themselves how unprepared for the test they were. And they all backed out. <laughs> and so it was me and my friend in this huge room, set up 20 something people. And it's me and him. Now, I ain't going to say the test was easy. It wasn't. Four questions, four hours. And it took all four of them. But you know what? He and I passed. Everybody else that was up there that could have taken the test, probably most of them would have passed. But they talk themselves into failure. And see, a lot of times with testing, the reason why people fail is because they talk themselves into failure. And that's true in God's school, too. Did you know we're all in God's school? I know you wish, boy, I wish I could graduate. Well, don't say that yet. That means you go to heaven. That's graduation day. You get your hood and gown and you out of here. We're all in God's school. We're all in that process. We've talked about it being transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so how does God do that? He does that with this. He does that by taking us through lessons, like he's taking these people through lessons, and then he puts us in a situation where we have to be tested. So you think about these people where did they come from? Well, they've seen God deliver them from Egypt. They've seen God enable them to walk across the Red Sea. They've seen God destroy their enemy in the Red Sea. They've seen God provide water for them at Mara. They've seen God provide a, a respite for them at Elam. They've had five lessons. Now it's tested. 
And see, God does us the same way. He lets situations come into our life that are going to uh, be like lessons for us where he's teaching us things. And then he's going to put us in some kind of situation where what we're supposed to have learned by now will be tested. Now, what happens if you don't pass the test? You have to take it again. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> you have to repeat the grade. And how many times have we had to repeat the lesson? And sometimes over and over and over and over. Don't feel bad, they will. They're going to. They're going to repeat it over and over and over and over and over. Well, that was that wasn't in here, that was offered. Um so let's let's get into the meat of this. So we gave them the testing. Uh, we know from the narrative some of them didn't listen they did it they did what they wanted and they um, were exposed for that and then God told uh, Moses to save some of the uh, manna and put it into what's going to be the Ark of the Covenant later as a future testimony to the uh, future generations about what God did for them there now I know some people are, are like Bible trivia what does manna mean? It means, what is it? They didn't know. So since they didn't know, I, I guess I can add my little two cent worth there and say, I think it's donuts. <laughs> <laughs> because it said it was heavenly way for life. And so I think God opened a crispy cream and he started raining those little pieces of heaven down every morning. And no wonder they wanted to store up extra. <laughs> I would too. Man, I, I'd be one of them getting in trouble. I have my Krispy Kremes all stacked up in my house, in my tent. And just like Krispy Kreme donuts, the next day they're not any good. So you got to have fresh ones every day and with a hot flat flash. <laughs> and, and it says in the description they would melt. Well, don't donuts melt your mouth if they're hot? So I think I've solved that problem. They didn't know what it was, but I do. It was donut. All right. So let's see if we can pull some truth out of your forks. When God starts a new thing, number one, all of God's actions are purposeful. Now, I've said all along, all behavior is purposeful. What we do, we do for a reason. And usually the reason is an attempt to meet some kind of a need. God does the same thing. God does not waste action. What he does in our life, he does for a purpose. And so sometimes that purpose may be a moral experience where God's cleansing us of something. Sometimes that purpose may be an Elam experience where uh, God just kind of gives us a break and, and life just kind of hums along and we're not really being pressed on anything right then. Sometimes we're in this phase of it and God's teaching us something. And when he's teaching us something, we don't always like that because it usually happens that part of the lesson is going to be a set of circumstances we don't want. Now, contrary to popular opinion, God does send bad things into the lives of good people. I hate to tell you, but it does happen. And it's not what we want to be true, but it is true. God does send bad things into the life of good people. And just because you're a good person doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be problem free. Everything we face in life for the person who's in Christ is filtered by God. And he sent it our way for a reason. Now we have to remember first and foremost, what has God already predetermined or predestined? We like that word. Predestined is going to happen. If you remember Romans 8 verses 28 through 30, he says we're predestined to be 
conformed to the image of his son. That's not an option. If you're in Christ, that's going to happen. Now, if we choose not to cooperate with it, life gets hard. Because you're living contrary to the Holy Spirit that's dwelling within you. And I'm going to tell you, when life gets hard, it doesn't work anymore. Everything begins to break down. Because God is not, has not given us the power to decide if we want to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. That's the template. That's what happens when someone is in Christ. And so part of that is he's going to take us through these phases. Could be a cleansing period. Could be a rest period. Most of it's going to be a teaching period and a testing period. So everything God does is for a purpose. Number two, God often uses problems or trials to promote growth and maturity in us. Uh, you know, one of the, it's one of the things we know about uh, weightlifting. When you look, the reason people lift weights is to make their muscles bigger. They make their muscles bigger by tearing them. They tear them with the trial of lifting those weights. And I, you know, I, when I was a teenager, I wanted to do all that stuff. Man, I had my little barbell and I had to work, you know, and I wanted to be all them muscle guys. I, did. I got tired of it after a while and quit. But, it, you know, I, did, I wanted to be all that muscle stuff. I saw a couple this week when I was going home <clears throat> who were jogging up the road. Well, he was jogging, she was walking. But, uh, you know, when I, when I drove by them, they weren't smiling. You know, if I'm going to do something like that, I want to be going, boy, this is great. Boy, I'm loving this. Yeah, this is wonderful. There was no smiles. She, he was like, and she was like this, walking up the hill. Now, I know some people like that. I understand that. But why did they do that? Well, they do that for the cardiovascular effect, but also to build up their stamina so that they can run farther and farther and farther. That's how you run a marathon. Listen, I could not run a marathon today. I know that's shocking. <laughs> I don't even want to drive a marathon today. That's less run one. But I couldn't do it because I've done no training. Those guys have to run all the time. Well, that's how the body gets stronger. Well, guess how we get stronger spiritually? It's by being exercised by trials so that we have to keep practicing our faith. We have to keep practicing our trust. The more we practice it, the stronger it gets. And the stronger it gets, the more like Jesus we become. That's why God uses trials to promote growth. He doesn't use good times to promote growth. He uses the trying times to promote growth. The, the good times are just to let us rest. But when God gets ready to do a new thing and starts uh, wanting to move in us in a fresh way, he's going to start pushing us to do some things that normally we wouldn't do. And another thing he's going to do is exactly what he did with these people. He's going to give us a hunger for whatever that new thing is. See, he had, he had, to, he had to give them a sense of disturbance. He had to un, un, uh, give them a sense of not being at rest anymore. They had a need, and that need was driving them to God. So I know saying something like that about trials or, or testing doesn't sound good, but what does the Bible say about it? Well, in James 1, we read these words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever... You face trials of many kinds. Not just a few kinds, of many kinds. And we all know you, everybody faces their own trials. And those trials, I don't know about you. I'll just talk to myself now. Self, I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy trials. So I cannot stand here and say I count it pure joy. Because I don't. That's something God still has to work on me. 
Count it all joy. Pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith, the test of your faith, produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So he didn't say it's the evil times that get you there. It's the testing times that get you there. And if you think about it, how do we relate to people more? By their success or their failures and weaknesses and suffering? We relate on the basis of what they've been through more than, hey, I've never had a problem. You ever heard anybody like that? I've never had a problem. There's lots of stuff. Really? I can't relate to that. I've had many. I've had many testing times. But you know what happens? The more tests God gives us that we pass, not only do we grow more, we mature more, but he gives us more authority in return, more spiritual authority. And there is a difference between someone who just goes around saying, in Jesus' name, I'm going to do this, and somebody who carries such authority, they, have, they don't have to say anything. This stuff just happens. Can you imagine being like, um, well, I told y'all about, um, what, was, what was the preacher's name? Oh, my goodness. Um, Osteen's dad, John. He, he could speak and boom, stuff would happen spiritually. He could speak to people and their, and their lives would change just like that. You know why? He had authority. Charles Finney could walk through a place and people start hitting the floor with him. And he wouldn't say nothing. He didn't say anything. He just walked through there and be boom, 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 boom. They were hitting the floor. That's authority. See, people have to pass the test to get up to that kind of authority. All right. Number three. Our natural reaction during these times of testing is to complain or groan. So I can't throw too much uh, dirt at these people for grumbling. I would be grumbling too. Might as well be honest. If I was having a walk through the desert, first of all, I'd be grumbling about the heat. Where's the air conditioning? Uh, I'd be grumbling that there wasn't any uh, food readily available. I'd be grumbling because there wasn't a nice place to sleep at night. I mean, I think of all kinds of things I'd be grumbling about too. So I can't just say they were bad people for doing it. I would be grumbling too if I'd been there. Because I know how I am now when I'm facing situations. Now I know I'm the only one does it. No one else here grumbles and complains. So y'all just have mercy on me, okay? But the natural reaction to that, to being in those times, is to grumble. Why? Why is that the natural reaction? Because grumbling is rooted in something we may not think about that often. Fear and pride. Oh, somebody said pride and injustice. I deserve better than this. And if it's, if I'm not getting what I feel like I deserve, you're going to hear about it. So they were grumbling. We deserve better than this. In fact, life was better back in Egypt than it is here. They forgot the sting of the whip. They forgot those long days pulling blocks. They forgot all that. So grumbling, complaining is a common reaction when we're going through these times where God is testing us. You know, one of the things that I said at the beginning we have to come to grips with is that God is not the American God. God is not devoted first and foremost to our happiness and success. 
He's devoted to transforming us into the likeness of Christ. And if we try to get him off of any other, other agenda, he won't go. And so we need to be, understand that and, uh, com, and go along and com, uh, comply with what he's doing in our life. All right, number four. What's a better reaction than when we're going through these trials, we're going through these times of testing? What's a better reaction? Well, a better reaction is to understand who we are in Christ. What's going on? What's going on is, is we need to remember that we're being transformed into the likeness of his son. And what it takes to get us to that point is going to vary to the individual. But ultimately, that's where it's all going. You know, we in the youth group today, we were talking about what do you do? We're looking at the attributes of God and what do you do when the attributes seem to contradict? Because you see that God is merciful but at the same time he's a God of judgment and justice so what do you do with that well the thing that holds it all together the glue that holds it all together is the fact that he's doing everything according to his plan now we don't always know what that is we don't always understand why God will raise up this people from their sick bed but this one he doesn't we, we don't always understand why God would uh, allow this person to escape any kind of serious consequences for their behavior, but this person, they only did it one time and they got the max in consequences. It doesn't make sense to us, but that's because we're not in charge of God's plan. It's his plan. We're part of it now. But what he's doing is he's working in us to bring us to the place where we can be effective in our part in carrying out his plan. Does that make sense? You see, he wants us in the family business. And the family business is God is bringing all of creation back to himself. And he wants us involved in that. Our primary task is to reach out to other people and try to bring them to the Father, bring them to the family. But God's got something for all of us to do in his family business. Before he can use us, though, he has to get us prepared first. So that's where these testing times come from. He's making us like Jesus so that we can be effective in reaching out to others. You know, the very thing about witnessing to people you can only witness about something you've experienced yourself. We were talking about how, have you ever talked, uh, asked somebody a question, and they rambled around and tried to give you an answer, but you knew they didn't know what they were talking about. And sometimes, if we try to witness to something that isn't real to us, it comes across like that. But if it's real to you, you can bear witness. Let me tell you what happened in my life when I went through this. Let me tell you what God did in my life when I went through this. And then it becomes personal. And it, it, it is empowered then to do something in that person's life. That's why every now and then, depending on who's here, I like to share my own story about coming to Christ. Because it, it's, you know, sometimes people think, well, if you just say this prayer, you're in. And that's not true. See, it begins with the Holy Spirit drawing you. Yes. It begins with conviction. And then you respond to the invitation of receiving Christ and his payment for your sin. Amen. That's what leads to salvation. It's not, okay, let me say this prayer on the back of the track. And so God's got something for all of us to do. And he's preparing you right now to do that thing. Whatever that thing is, he's preparing you right now to do it. That's the reason why we go through these times of trials or testing.
You see, we all have needs. If you're here today, you've probably got some need that only God can really fix. And you may have prayed and prayed and prayed, and like these folks, you were hungry. You are hungry. And you've been calling out to God. God, do something. God, fix this. God, please do this. Please intervene. Do this. Please do something, God. And God intervenes, but he doesn't leave it there. He intervenes, but then there's a test that's included. Okay, here's your answer. Now, here's what you've got to do to keep this answer. Will you obey? Now, I'm driving home to make it real simple. I know everybody here is wealthy, so I'm talking to other folks. If you ever had that bill, you couldn't pay. And you know you couldn't pay it because maybe you haven't been the wisest with spending. And you pray, and you pray, and, and God comes through, and God comes through. God. And then one time, God's going to come through and say, now listen, you're going to have to get control of this so that you don't find yourself back repeating this lesson again. Here's what you have to do. <clears throat> then we face a, a situation where we got to respond to the intervention. And we have to obey and go do what he said now we've got to do. Or do you remember the man who was healed and Jesus said, stop sinning or something worse is going to come upon you? See, we're, we're thankful for the interventions, but sometimes those interventions come with a test. Will you obey You know, I wish I could see that lady that used to come up every Sunday and say, pray for my husband and I pray for my marriage and my husband quit being so mean. We, we just fuss all the time. Well, I could pray about that, but the wisdom for her would be, but we'll quit fussing. <laughs> no, I got to stay on my ground. Oh, then you're not going to obey. So why we got to intervene? Just so you can repeat the lesson. Well, for Israel, some of them, they already failed. So they're going to get to repeat the lesson. My prayer for us, because we want to see God do a, good, a new thing here. That means he's going to bring some change here. He's going to bring some change in us. I don't know about you. I don't like him. But if we're going to have a new thing, there's going to have to be some change. And so we're praying. We're hungry. We want to see God do something. And God's going to start intervening. But many times of those interventions, you're going to come a test. Will you obey? If you don't obey, you get to repeat. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like the guy who the only way he could pass third grade was marry the teacher. <laughs> and I know none of us would. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, just as you were patient with the Israelites as they were grumbling and complaining. Lord, you intervened, but you intervened with a test because you're in the process of doing something new in these people. You're giving them a new worldview. You're changing them. You're, you're conforming them into your people. Lord, help us to see that we go through these same stages. There's times in life we're at a moral uh, season where you're cleansing us of stuff. 
There'll be other times when we're in an Elam, Elam period and, and life seems to be going pretty well and we think we finally got it all worked out. And, uh, it's gonna be smooth sailing from now on. And then there's times where you're bringing the lessons and you're orchestrating the circumstances that force us to learn to practice truth and to exercise trust in you. Lord, may we not succumb to talking ourselves into defeat or making excuses or trying to get around the test. Help us, Lord, to see that when you start working on us in some area, it's for our good. And it's for something that you want to change in us because you're seeking to do a new thing in us. With the ultimate thing being making us like your son. And so, Father, I pray for each family today that you will have your way in their home. That you will have your way in their lives. Lord, help them to see which phase they're in in their relationship with you today. If they're in that cleansing phase, help them, Lord, I pray that you ground repentance. Father, if they're in that rest phase, help them, Lord, to rest and not take it for granted because it will end. There will come the time they have to move on to the desert. And Lord, if they're in that phase of you're trying to teach them a lesson right now, you're trying to strengthen their faith and trying to bring about a change that needs to be made, I pray for grace and for mercy and, and Lord, wisdom and courage to change what needs to change. And Lord, I pray for all of us as a church that we will be committed to your agenda. That we won't get sidetracked by things going on in the culture. That we will be wholly devoted to you and to your plan. And I pray your blessing on each family. I pray, Father, this week they will be blessed and they will prosper as their souls prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you for coming. Hope you have a great week.